Hello, this is a video to look at uh, module two from Art History 2, uh, the art history course that's offered through Wabash Valley and Illinois Eastern Community Colleges. My name is Mike Kahn, I'm the instructor for the course. Um, module two looks at uh, chapter 17, 18, and 19 in Jensen's Art history and is a transition from the late Renaissance period, sometimes called Mannerism, and leading up to the Baroque period. Uh, the Baroque period really starts at the 1600s, so we're talking about the late 1500s to the 1600s, um, and uh, this is a transition time in art that feels the effect of the Renaissance, but then also has uh, great turmoil in um, the religious orders of this time period in this um, particular location, which is um, kind of uh, European um, uh, art that is, has been influenced for years by the Roman Catholic Church. And then you have the, uh, the Reformation with Martin Luther and the breaking of the uh, uh, Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformation and the type of art that comes af afterwards. So you have Protestant Reformation art, um, artists like Albert Durr, um, who, you know, kind of are, are taking cues from that re religious change. And then uh, you have the Counter Reformation, uh, which leads to uh, many of the great uh, Baroque art pieces that we see. So a good place to start when, when we're talking about the, um, the uh, art that uh, is seen in module two is the later work of Michelangelo. So uh, what you're looking at here is uh, Michelangelo's The Last Judgment from 1534 to 1541 which is in the Sistine Chapel. The Sistine Chapel is uh, a small chapel that's on the backside of the Vatican. So if you go to the Vatican or you go to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, it's this huge um, complex that is the, um, you know, kind of centerpiece or where the Pope lives and, you know, the, the headquarters for the Catholic Church. And the Grand Cathedral, um, which is huge and vast and very um, uh, opulent, um, is contrasted by the small um, cathedral that's on the, the backside of the church. And this is uh, historically a private chapel for the Pope and the Cardinals. So one way that you could think about this, the Sistine Chapel is that the large cathedral is for the masses, for the, the people, but where do the cardinals and the Pope go to a church? Well, where they go is they have their own private chapel that's on, that's on the smaller side, and they would have kind of smaller services there for the, all the different people that worked um, at the Vatican, which is a, you know, a considerable amount of people. Um, at some point, uh, this structure was painted uh, all along the walls and on the ceilings. And at one point, Michelangelo did the ceilings, which is the classic pieces of the Sistine Chapel on the back. Many years later, he did this piece. It's called The Last Judgment. It's very much influenced by Giotto's Last Judgment. If you go back you know, a few chapters back, you find Giotto does a similar work on fresco called the Last Judgment, Michelangelo was very aware of that piece of work and used that as an influence. Now, um, when you look at this piece, and the book goes into great detail about it, you see um, what uh, is known as kind of the beginnings of the mannerism style, which is this kind of exaggerated um, style that has um, uh, you know, kind of pastel colors, exaggerated bodies, and kind of strange contortions and kind of hyper dramatic um, framing and kind of distortions of the body. You know, one way or one great example is if you look at in the center, uh, you see this this huge muscular character that's surrounded by light, and that is Michelangelo's Jesus. 
Well, if you look at that for a second, it's not really what you would classically think of as how Jesus looks, right? Jesus is not this, you know, kind of, uh, you know, like a bodybuilder, but that's how uh, Michelangelo depicts him. And that's very characteristic of this mannerism style, which is exaggerated, exuberant, kind of um, over the top, if you will. There's also an unnatural use of light and, and color. The blues are very blue. The reds are very red. There's these like, you know, kind of auras coming off of, 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 of people. So that's characteristic of the mannerism style. And you see that how it influences artists uh, later. There's also kind of a grandness to it. I mean, this is a huge piece of art. Okay, the next piece that we want to look at is um, uh, something that you will see in, um, in the uh, um, 18th chapter, which is talking primarily about the Renaissance and Reformation in the 16th century Northern Europe. And what happens is, of course, if you know anything about uh, world history is you have the Reformation, Martin Luther breaks away from the Catholic Church, and you have a counter movement in the religion of this time period. Now, Albrecht, Albrecht, Albrecht Dürer uh, is very much a part of that tradition, and you can see in his work a severity, and that's one thing that's kind of characteristic of German work and of, of work of the Reformation, is that you'll see a seriousness or a severity of the of the story so instead of color we see black and white instead of themes of this like kind of joyful nature or these over the top scenes we see kind of you know very serious scenes in this case we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse it's a somber scene it's um it's dro it's dramatic but it's also kind kind of dark in its uh, connotation uh, the other thing that's interesting about the work of Albert Durr is it has a, 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 a stylistic quality that's uh, grounded in drawing. You'll see that in his paintings, in his um, etchings, they have this, um, this linear quality to them. They're built up through multiple uses of lines, and there's a great detail to the work. Now, this is a woodcut uh, print, which is... Uh, he would have a big block of wood and carve out all the de all the details, and then he would, you know, overlay that with ink, and then put a piece of paper on top and press it in and make multiples of of these. So one thing that's kind of interesting is that you can go to many museums and see the exact same piece because there's multiples of the exact piece that he made. He was making prints basically from these wood blocks. He'd probably done something similar in elementary school where you may have had like a rubber pad and you had to carve it out and then you roll on top. It's basically just a you know really elaborate stamp that you're stamping onto a piece of paper. There's also a, on page 638, it may be a different page in, in your book. My, my book's slightly different. Uh, you have uh, the most famous Albrechter work, which is his self-portrait that's sometimes also known self-portrait as, as Jesus, but in this text it's called self-portrait, and you can see the incredible detail in his painting. Okay, so this is the last one I want to show you here, and this is going to be the type of work that we will see in chapter 19, and this is the transition to the Baroque period. Now, the Baroque period uh, is a very much a Roman uh, period that branches from, from Rome, and uh, it's a response to the Reformation as part of the Counter-Reformation. And what happens is Rome uh, loses uh, you know, uh, all kinds of people through the, the Reformation, and they want to bring back people into the fold and through the counter reformation there's an uh, explosion of art that is created or funds that are made available for the beautification of the churches and uh, a certain style develops during this time period that is grounded in observation looking at models um, 
uh, natural light. So you'll always see a singular light source. Also, drama uh, characterizes the Baroque period. So this is the work of Caravaggio, and you see all of those characteristics in this painting. This one is called The um, Calling of St. Uh, Matthew. In it, you have Jesus uh, on one side pointing towards St. Matthew. Matthew is pointing at himself because he's a tax collector. He says, you want me? Are you sure? I'm kind of a bad guy here. I'm a thief. I'm stealing the people's money. But, you know, of course, in the Bible, he becomes one of the 12 apostles. Jesus is shown in a fairly realistic way. The only thing that you, you can denote that he's heavenly is this, you know, kind of very small, slight halo that's above his head. Um, but the thing that's characteristic about a Caravaggio painting is the light. Notice how there's this window open and there's this spotlight that comes down onto Matthew and highlights and how there is this distinct break between light on the face and then the dramatic shadows. And this kind of break, this um, dramatic shift in light um, is uh, what characterizes the Baroque period. It's dramatic, it's realistic, and it's incredibly um, uh, sophisticated in its quality. If you see these paintings in life, you're amazed that a human being had the ability to paint this with such detail and, uh, and a grace. So um, you're going to learn about um, Artemisia Jen Teleski, who's very much influenced by Caravaggio. You'll also learn about the work um, of Bernini and the amazing architecture that's in Rome, the altarpiece, the newly designed um, uh, St. Mark's Cathedral. You'll um, learn about... Um, the, how sculpture changed, and uh, Diego Velasquez, the wonderful Spanish paint, painter, how the Baroque period leaves Rome and starts to influence uh, Spanish art and French art, um, and then we'll kind of end at, um, you know, the kind of shifts to when uh, it really starts to expand into the Netherlands and into France. So uh, these three um, Chapters are very much about a transition in the arts growing from the Renaissance and the incredible high quality and scope of the Renaissance, leading to artists that start to look at the natural world for cues. So whereas the um, Renaissance artists were looking at ancient Greece and ancient traditions, the Baroque period artists start to really focus in on looking at models, drawing from, from life, and what happens in the natural world. Okay, I hope you enjoy this chapter, and as always, if you have any uh, questions, uh, feel free to email me at uh, conm at iecc.edu. Thank you.